Um, when he was three years old, his older siblings forgot him at the park. And when they came back to get him, they found him walking home at a stoplight surrounded by a pack of dogs that would not let him cross the street. I assume that since he's here, he survived. So everyone, please welcome David. Uh, thank you. I appreciate the time to, to, to be here today and talk to you guys about the RStudio ecosystem is a critical part of NASA's analytical capabilities. And my apologies to RStudio. I, I guess I should change that to the posit, but I'd already had these slides done, so I left them alone. So let me ask really quick, how many are from a government agency? All right, so you might relate to some of this. There's not going to be any code in this. It's more about the journey of how we try to create our analytical architecture and the things that I've had to go through. So first thing, so, hi. Usually I want to just make sure that everybody understands, you know, we're here just to have a good time. We're here to just to understand what we can do within the analytical community. One of the things I do want to tell you about this presentation, this is not a presentation about R versus Python. When I first announced this talk, everybody's going, great, we're going to hear why R is better than Python. This is not that kind of a talk. It is how we can use R and Python together to be able to do this within the architecture because I have a team that's made up of both R and Python developers. So, so who am I and what do I do? Um, very long sentence, you know, paragraph here, basically I'm the head of analytics for uh, human capital at NASA, uh, overseeing the analytical architecture. When I first came up to headquarters back in 2019, they asked me to take a look at how we can improve our analytical architecture, make it more modern, because we had a lot of things going wrong with this within the business side of, of NASA. So money, you know, NASA gets a good chunk of money, you know, not, not as much as a lot of agencies, but more than some. Most of that money, rightfully so, goes to things like supporting the International Space Station, climate science, you know, getting Orion up and around the moon and back and making sure that we can get to Mars eventually. On the business side of things where I'm at, where I've, I've grown up working within NASA, within the OCIO, now human capital, I've done some work in knowledge management. You know, you're thinking about OCFO, the procurement. We don't get as much money. So we kind of have to do with what we have and make things work as best we can. So when I first started this journey several years ago, my laptop or desktop at that time was my development environment. We didn't have cloud resources. We didn't have anything to do. And our data pipeline, of course, because of that, was not automated. The automation was me going every morning and clicking run the script in order to run the data, run the do the calculations, and then send that somewhere so that it could be do some more calculations and then back to the presentation layer. And that presentation layer was basically Again, my laptop. I would go from meeting to meeting going, here, this is what your figures look like. You can go to the next meeting. Here, this is what it looks like. It, it was really very, very disheartening, I guess, at the time, just to try to do all of this and go, we've got to do better. We've got so many new modern technologies out there. Why can't we do better in here? Again, it came down to resources. So what can we do to really make this work? So some of the other things we were missing, of course, lack of access to authoritative data sources. Many times, here's, here's how the conversation would go. I would knock on the door. I need access to the last 10 years of people data. Great, which data do you need? I, need? I don't know. I don't know what data you have. Can you just give me the data? Oh, no, I need to know what data you need in order for me to give it to you. I said, okay, do you have a data dictionary? What's that? <laughs> okay. All right, let's see what we can do. So over the years, we finally started to work through these people. I've got them to understand the data governance process understand what a data owner is, what, a data, what the different data roles are, got them to give us a data dictionary so that we could start getting it. And I finally, finally, this was exciting, a couple of weeks, a couple of months ago in a meeting, the data, the, the person that oversees all the data, IT and human capital and the data, anything that David and his team want, they can get. No questions asked. I said, thank you. So they finally was able to get that kind of a data. And for those of you who have that trouble, know how hard that can be. That was the good news. The not so good news is I'm still working firewall issues across some of the different organizations to make sure I can even get access to that data. And of course, because of that, we didn't have any data lake or any way to store our AI ML curated data sets ready for an analytics. It was still grabbing the data from a SQL server or some other type of database, putting it into our laptop. Now we're starting to do it more on cloud resources and doing the transformation, doing it. We're slowly working through that back in 2019, uh, with the, well, actually 2020 now, I guess, when, with the start of COVID, 
we realized that we needed to be able to provide data. And that kind of gave us an impetus and a little bit of funding to start developing what we call the enterprise data platform. And I'll show you some architecture here that we're working through that I'm trying to promote to OCIO to say, this is kind of the things that we need. What can you develop for us as we go through that? And of course, through this, there was no AIMO DevOps and no presentation capabilities other than my laptop and going around from meeting to meeting. ClickShare made it a lot easier when we finally started using that to be able to click into a board rather than having to show it on my laptop. So what do we need? Well, what I need is a collaborative development environment that supports both R and Python. Because I've got some computer scientists that have turned into data scientists that started off learning Python. I've got some IO psychologists in life sciences who utilize R. So we've got to make sure they can talk together. And one thing that I, I, that I really like about Quarto to, to Shirley's uh, presentation is the fact that you can do both R and Python in there and actually share those presentations, those documents by freezing the code. So when you send it to somebody, that the, if you send your R code to somebody that's working on Python, it doesn't try to run their code if they don't have R on there. They can do their Python code, freeze it and send it back to you. And it really works well on, on collaborating across teams like that. We also need a modern data pipeline, something where I don't, I can actually do a script, put it up there on a job and let it run automatically and send it through that. Uh, we need the data lake, of course, for those AIML curated data sets, the more cloud resources and a platform. Those are the things I was asking for. I didn't think it was a whole lot, uh, but it's taken me several years to try to get to this point. So here's kind of what I, we're looking for our future state. Uh, as you can see here, we're looking here to try to get some kind of AIML De DevSecOps operations here. So we've asked for, um, in this case, we've got a, 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 they're developed what they've called AppDAT, which is an application data platform, uh, which allows us to utilize various containers, image containers in the Kubernetes cluster to be able to do all of this with, with configuration management, with GitLab. Uh, so it's starting to, starting to get a little bit easier so that we can share our code and go across that. The biggest thing here was this area right here, opening up the firewalls between our authoritative data source our data lake and utilizing our tools in RStudio, uh, Alterx for some no-code, low-code type things, and then putting that through some ML DevOps with Vetiver as well as Kubeflow over to our presentation layers, utilizing both Tableau or actually Tableau Power BI now and the RStudio Connect system with all the various capabilities in there. All of that has given us a freedom to be able to utilize many different tools, not locked into one thing. So those who know code, can work in R and Python, uh, in SQL and some other things. Those who rather not work with code can work with Alteryx. We're taking a look right now at Data Fusion, uh, which is a Google a G on GCP as a data prep type thing. There's also Tableau Prep and some other tools, but there's definitely a lot of capabilities. But what I really, what I think is really important is this bottom layer right here. When you're talking to your organization, you have to have that R&D layer. We were so far behind the technology stack and it, because we weren't looking at it over time that it made it really difficult to get caught up. So I've tried to get, make sure that we understand we've got to set aside funding for some type of research and development to understand and learn how that technology is changing over time and how we may be able to use some of that. Otherwise, we'll, come, we'll be here five years from now trying to re-up our technology and taking a long time again because we didn't prepare for what's out there and what's new. So again, going back to the development platform now, what I have is the RStudio Pro or Server Pro out there that allows me to do many, many things again across the different platform. We've got, of course, the RStudio IDE. We can do Jupyter Notebooks, Jupyter Lab, Python, R. Um, I don't think what I have on there is Visual Code, which is also now part of the RStudio system uh, to be able to do that. And it allows my, my developers to create so many different things in various different platforms and web architectures. Not only do we have the Shiny, but we can do Streamlit, Flask, Plotly, and now with the, uh, the new creation of the Shiny for Python and what is that web? I forget the name of that now that, that allows you to put that actual Shiny application on somebody's website or, or browse, send, send them the Shiny app without having to put it on a connect server. I forget that web technology name from the acronym right now and I apologize for that. It's my 60 years of being on this earth. I forget some things sometimes. So what we do now, what we have is our data pipeline working through here. So now I'm able to get to my authoritative data sources and extract that data utilizing some type of you know, container, 
some type of script, something now that I could automate either on the, uh, the Connect server, which allows me to put up there a script and, and set a job, or through a container on the Kubernetes cluster to allow me to do the same thing. But all, that all allows me to take that raw data, do some transformation within R and or Python, and turn that into what we call trusted data. Now that data is taking everything we've had, we've cleaned it up, we've taken our raw data, cleaned it up, put it in the format we need to be able to say, this is, the, if, this is what we're going to use for analysis. It's been cleaned, it's been formatted, it's ready to go. Then we can start doing some modeling, statistical analysis, create our pipelines, create everything else we need for the an analysis, and turn that into curated data sets. That curated then becomes what we utilize to share by, create, by taking that curated data set, I can now put a API on top of that using Plumber or Fast API within, again, within the eco, that RStudio ecosystem to allow other organizations to share our curated data set that's been clean, it's been removed of any kind of sensitive information or any PII, and they can, we can now share that out to other organizations, again, through our presentation layer. Now, this is still kind of new for us. We're still trying to develop this with the MLOps. Um, so I just took basically the information straight off of the website of what Vetiver does, but it allows us to really start utilizing our, our development of our models, whether we're doing an attrition model or time to hire model, or we're taking a look at the uh, engagement of our employees. We can now use Vetiver to create those models, to, to keep track them, to monitor them, to update them, again, both in R and or Python, either way, however, however our developers create them, and then make them accessible. And we can make them accessible uh, through, through many different combination or many different techniques here. Again, whether we're, we're allowing somebody to connect to that model through their development environment, or creating an a, a API through Plumber, or some or Fast API again to allow us to be able to showcase some of those things. So, so it really starting to open up what we can do, and really for minimal cost compared to some of the other things that we're trying that we were trying to do. Um, and we're talking right now. You know, a couple of million dollars we've been able to utilize to set all of our environment up, uh, which may sound like a lot, but when you're really thinking about the, what the organizations spend, uh, it's really helping the, in the business side or the institutional side develop something with minimal cost and able to maintain this very easily. So what does that allow us to do? Well, as, as we deliver our products, we've got a high volume of requests, both ad hoc and recurrent analysis that we do. We get, I get congressional calls that, that from my superiors saying, Congress wants this, we need it now. So those things happen all the time. So we need to be able to move quickly, get that data through that. Or we have things that we're constantly doing from our metrics, from our uh, DEIA or data uh, uh, component, from a demographics component. Uh, all of that, we have to take an eye and look at how we're going to develop these things. This environment allows us to work very rapidly. It allows us to think about what we're doing and repeat and reproduce the analysis we're doing because we're able to share across different uh, different platforms as well as across different developers. So when we deliver our products, we then have something like this, which is more of a dash uh, a landing page. This particular landing page is a Tableau landing page that actually connects to con the Connect server that allows us to show our Shiny applications or other applications that we have on there. It also actually leads to a Shiny, a, landing page on the connect server so we have to, we're trying to mimic this on the connect server so you have two entry points to be able to do that and these this is basically broken down into different categories and we try to we try to make sure we curate these things so they're similar in 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 look and feel as well as what's available to the end users so the end users when they go to one of our dashboards or one of our products they're going to be, have a place where they can give us feedback tell us what's good what's wrong what we need to do or ask for a request they can watch a tutorial on how to use the dashboard, as well as the, the important thing is look at the data dictionaries and documentation of how that analysis was done. Because too many times we get our reports and go out there and people make up their own conclusions. We need to make sure they understand the assumptions, so they understand what's going on, they understand how the data was pulled, where you can actually generalize this data against, you know, maybe it's only for a particular population, not for the entire population. So we, we try to have the, all that information there so people can utilize this. And again, this makes it repeatable, reproducible. So year after year after year, we're comparing the same data across that time frame rather than different data, which we've done in the past many times using laptops. You know, one person would create an analysis on one laptop, another person on another laptop, and, and they go, well, the numbers don't match up. Why? 
we spent hours and hours trying to figure out, well, you didn't do this on, when, you, when you transformed this data set, we did, and that's why we're getting this. This way, we're all using the same curated data set. We are talking about the same type of data. So that helps there. So what's really cool and what I really like, again, I talked a little bit about Plumber API, Plumber Tableau uh, and Fast API. We have, a, again, in, within the team, there's a group of both data scientists and data analysts, and these data scientists and data analysts, they do different things. The data analysts primarily work on business intelligence type things on the um, analytical kind of levels. They're more looking at the descriptive and maybe some of the diagnostic type capabilities that they're, they're doing. So they're not really interested in, in actually working with the algorithms, developing the algorithms and doing the models. And of course, the data scientists are more looking across the entire platform, but also the predictive and the prescriptive side of the analytics. So they're creating these models, these visualizations, these different capabilities that we can turn into an, a Tableau extension via the APIs. And through Tableau, you can load that into the Tableau analysis. So now we've got both the combination of Tableau and visualization with some R capabilities. Tableau is great, but there's some limitations to it. You can't send data back and forth. So I can't update anything if I want to. So through, through some of these extensions, we can help with some of that. Uh, so this is some of the products we've created just from our survey data, taking a look at our employee engagement, our federal employee viewpoint surveys, uh, and how we do this. And, and for those of you who, who in the government and know that, we've actually taken our FEV survey in-house. So now we're able to do this and, and get the data much quicker and get the results back out to our, to our managers uh, in, in a month rather than several months through usually through OMB. So, uh, but this is a great technology. We started working with this probably about two, three months, two, three months ago and really starting to develop it. I've got some of my data scientists trying to develop models that we can then post on some of these Tableau uh, sites here. So, but as I mentioned, Tableau can't do everything. The Connect server really comes into play here where we can do a lot of different things. So on the top left-hand side over here, this is more of an application that walks somebody through we're able to showcase, you know, I've got a, I've got a, a um, actuals that I'm looking for for my hiring. How did I do, you know, across my plan? Did that, did that plan actually come to fruition? So through a series of questions, they can answer these questions. It'll run through the model and show them how their, their hiring plans so actuals came out or other information. But, but because this is a, a presentation component that allows you to do many different things in just dashboard, the bottom left over here is, is a roadmap created uh, within the Connect server that's interactive and makes it makes it very easy to to see what we're working on, when we're working on, and update it very easily. And again, connectable to anybody within the network. Top right um, is a book, as uh, Sh uh, Shirley was talking about with Quarto, our markdown before that, but Quarto now. You can create books. Pres this presentation is actually a Quarto presentation that I'm working on here. Uh, but you can create books and we created a knowledge base. Uh, specifically for my human capital data scientists that's shareable on the Connect server. They can go through there and find information on various topics. They can update it. We can maintain it. So we've got this huge knowledge base of what we're working on and how we've done things that anybody can, in, within the in organization can go look at it and try to understand how we did things and learn from themselves how to do things. And then finally, of course, if we have metrics and developments down here uh, that models will create and generate and run on a daily basis and, and, and show the information. So that entire ecosystem just really helps us understand our, our pipeline a lot easier. We can work through that pipeline, send the data from the authoritative raw data all the way through the presentation layer. Uh, and I should have started with it. This, is a, this isn't a sales pitch you know, for, for our studio or anything. It's really more about what are the capabilities you have? This is what I had to work with. I, I have these, cap these capabilities in-house that I've been able to add to them. And it's just part of the architecture. We still have other things within that architecture. We have, uh, of course, Kubeflow. Uh, we have Orkis that we're looking at, uh, which is a, another pipeline. We've got Alterx. So there's many different things that make this up, but this is a critical component that answered a, quite a few pieces for what we were trying to do from the data development to the uh, data flow, uh, to the actual looking at the presentation layer and the, de and the DevOps. So it's a lot of good things that are capable there. And again, with relatively inexpensive uh, capabilities to do that, allows your organizations to work together across very different mediums. So lastly, I wanna thank you. I look forward to connecting with any of you that feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. 
But I do want to leave you with one cool fact. Uh, several years ago, I was at JPO before Curiosity landed on Mars, and I was talking to some of the, uh, uh, the developers there of the rover, and they told me this story where they had asked NASA management if they could put a JPO logo on the, the rover, and management said, no, nothing but a NASA sticker can go on there, no JPO logo. So the engineers being engineers saying, we're not going to take that. So what they did is on, on one of the wheels there in Morse code, it's a J, a P, and an L. So every time it runs on the Martian surface, it leaves the Morse code JPL on the Martian surface. So they got their JPL up there. Kudos to them for figuring out how to do that without showing up anybody. But it, it's, uh, I thought it was a pretty good idea what they did and show some of the ingenuity and things we can do at NASA. Thank you. I appreciate the time. And